chapter number 13, we're continuing our look in the book of Acts. I put the title on, on the board as the survey of the book of Acts. My intention, uh, both in the book of Acts and in our Romans through Philemon study, um, is to survey. And what a survey is, is kind of, it's just an, an, an overall look. Obviously, uh, there are going to be passages in the book of Acts that we can't dwell into as deep because for time's sake, it's 28 chapters. But then talking to Brother Steve a couple months back, he's, enjoy, he, he's you know, I, I ask people, am I going fast, slow, is it deep enough, not enough? I like to know, and, and different people have different uh, opinions. Um, but Brother Steve, I appreciate his input. He enjoys when I go into the verses and, and make sense of the passages and stuff. And that's what I want to do. That's my goal. We don't rush through the word of God. For all eternity, we're going to be spending time in God's word. We're going to be learning God's word even when we're in the heavenly places, because there's a lot to know about God. This word is eternal. And I truly believe the Apostle Paul will be teaching the body of Christ there in the heavenly places when we do have time for fellowship. We're going to be doing a lot of different things. But there will be fellowship time amongst the saints where we learn more and more about the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that. I know from the kingdom, in the kingdom, uh, the nation of Israel will... Uh, have these meetings where they not only have the word, but they'll be teaching the Gentiles. It's going to be a wonderful thing. The word of God is eternal. So I will take my time, but also survey it. Just so, I want to make sure you get the gist of what's going on back here in time past in the book of Acts. So just bear with me. We're in chapter 13. Go over to chapter 13 and look at verse 21. Chapter 13 and verse 21 is where we left off. Luke is the writer. Uh, the book of Acts is written to the nation of Israel. It's called the actions of the apostles or activity of the apostles. The, the theme of the book is to show the fall of the nation of Israel and salvation going to the Gentiles. The book in the Bible that explains how God is dealing with one nation and all of a sudden he's dealing with all nations the, sh the book that shows how that progression came, how that change came, is the book of Acts. And that's why we're looking at it, okay? I, I was thinking this is one of the most difficult books to, to study and to teach, but when you rightly divide it, you can get a lot of information in a, in a tiny amount of per a period of time. You can learn about God's prophetic program and his mystery program, because Paul's in, in the book of Acts, and it's a beautiful thing to see how the body of Christ grew. Let's look at it here. This is still Paul, uh, our apostle, dealing with the nation of Israel. He's giving them a recount of their um, history. In verse 21, we left off in Samuel in verse 20. He says in verse 21, And afterward they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul, the son of Kis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. Um, as he recounts their history, he is reminding the nation of Israel how they wanted to be just like those other nations, the Gentiles around them. God was their king. And when it says in verse 21, and they desired a king, they desired. By the way, the name of that king was Saul. His name means desired. Um, back here in time past, the first king of Israel's is name, Saul. That name means desired. Desired by them, okay? Saul. This, consequently, was the name of our Apostle Paul. That's his Hebrew name. He was named after the first king of Israel. He, he was of that same tribe, Benjamin. And so Saul means desired. Again, that's Israel's desire. Saul was not God's uh, first choice. He gave them what they want. In the same way, after the rapture with the Antichrist, when, uh, as, as the Antichrist comes on the scene there in Israel, uh, he is their desired one. They don't desire the man after God's own heart, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to desire this man, the Antichrist. Well, Israel did that back here before David with Saul. Look what it says in verse 21. And afterward, they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul, the son of Sis. Here it says Sis. In the Old Testament, it's Kish, K-I-S-H. It's just a, it's just a Greek word, uh, way of saying it a man of the tribe of Benjamin by the space of 40 years. Now that name Benjamin, if you know anything about Jacob, he had a, he had a, a wife, he had two wives, one named uh, Rachel and one named Leah. He had Leah first, you know the story. He was back here, he loved Rachel, and he, he labored 
uh, under his, it was really uh, his relative, Laban. Laban was related to uh, uh, Abraham. He was, a, he was amongst Abraham's family. But he labored for uh, Rachel for 14 years. He calls it uh, two weeks, two seven-year periods. Well, the second seven-year period, that was because Laban had fooled him and gave him not, not Rachel, but Leah. That's all familiar, okay? So he labored again, and then so he had, two, he had two wives. They were sisters, Leah and Rachel. Well, Rachel gave birth to a couple of boys, Joseph and Benjamin. When she gave birth to Benjamin, she died in labor. In fact, go with me, if you will. I want you to see this. Go, hold your hand here and go with me to Genesis chapter number 35, I believe that is. Genesis 35. I didn't have this on my notes, but I want you to kind of see what's going on. Genesis 35, why this is important. If I don't get it right, my wife's going to get me. Let's see here. She say I'm slipping when I don't. Ah, I got it. Genesis 35. Um, look at verse 16. Genesis 35, verse 16. And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Eph Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. So Rachel is now pregnant with Benjamin. She's now bringing forth. God designed it for, the, for nine months for that baby to be uh, full term. But then there's that extra week. Uh, we find out now that it's like 40 weeks worth. But that baby can be ready to go in that 36th week, right? So what happened is she had a hard labor. She was in travail. They were traveling. And watch what happens. It says... Uh, that she travailed and she had a hard labor, verse 17. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife, and this is the, the woman, uh, we'd call her the nurse in our day, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also, in addition to Joseph. Jo she had Joseph. Uh, verse 18. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she what? By the way, there's a definition of death. When your soul departs your physical body, you die. In the book of James, James says when you're, as, the, as the body without the spirit is dead, you're a spirit, soul, and body. You need all three of those to have physical life. If your soul leaves, you die. If your spirit leaves, you die. Here, her soul departed, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. Now, that name Benoni, that name means the son of my sorrow. As she's sitting here, and, and as God promised the woman with the, with, the, with the giving of birth, he says to Eve, I will multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. I'm seeing that with my wife. She has some type of new ailment since she's been pregnant. Not only the, the physical in the first trimester of the, and, and it's, it's, some have it worse than others, but she had the physical queasiness and all that. Now she's suffering from, uh, what is it? Her hands get tingly, and she loses the feel in her hands. Every, every day she's getting up in the middle of the night. And it's hard to see her go through this. She gets up four or five times a night wringing her hands out like that, you know, and then the back problems and all that stuff. Well, that's because it, it, to remind the female how God created her. When Eve usurped the, the man's authority, God, he judged all women in her. And it's just a, a, a reminder. Even in childbearing years when you have your, your um menstrual cycle, the cramps and all that, that's a reminder of what, of what happened way back in Genesis. And so some women have very hard pregnancies. This woman, Rachel, did to the point of death. And when she says, the son of my sorrow, she was, she was basically saying what happened to Eve. She says, I'm in this pregnancy. She's at the point of death, and she thought about the sorrows that come along with being a mother. So that name Benoni means son of my sorrow. Now, he's a type of the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you look at Israel's history, the first time he came, he was a man of sorrow acquainted with grief. Rachel is the mother of the nation of Israel. Uh, Rachel and Jacob. Are the, Jacob's the father. So check this out. When he came, the first time he was a son of sorrow, Benoni. But look at the second time what the father names him. Verse 18. But his father called him what? Benjamin. He says, oh, no. That's what you call him, honey. The son of our sorrows. But see, Jacob looks and says, no, this son is going to be powerful. He calls him Benjamin, which means the son of my right hand or the son of my strength. 
And what Benjamin is a type of, by changing his name from son of sorrow to the son of his strength, the first time Christ came, he died for them. He, suffered, he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. The second time, he's going to come with strength. The first time, he was God's son who suffered and died like the mother. The second time, he's going to come with power and great glory, the son of strength. And so why, when we look at Benjamin, that's the issue of Benjamin, the son of my strength. Saul was that guy. He was from that tribe. Israel desired this guy, give me somebody with some strength. Paul, our apostle, when he was Saul of Tarsus, he was from that same tribe of Benjamin. And that's the guy who the, believe, the, excuse me, the unbelieving Jews wanted to lead them. But he was the wrong one. Now watch this. Go back to, uh, on your way back to Acts, let's stop and see this issue of uh, Saul. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 8. Go over to 1 Samuel chapter 8. Not everybody knows about Saul, so we'll, we'll look at this guy Saul. By the way, the tribe of Benjamin was the favorite tribe of the nation of Israel. It was a favorite tribe. When, you, when, when, when Paul in Philippians 3 says, and Hebrew of the Hebrews of the tribe of Benjamin, he was saying, it's something special about me. They were the special tribe in the nation of Israel. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, look at verse 5. Samuel, he's a prophet. Remember we saw that God gave them judges up until the time of Samuel, and they desired a king. So here's what's going to transpire. Samuel is the prophet of Israel. God gives his word to them through Samuel. They say, no, no, no. We don't want a prophet telling us what to do from God. We want a king like them. Here's, here's what happened. Verse 5. 1 Samuel 8, verse 5. And said unto him, Behold, thou art old. So the, so the leaders of Israel come to Samuel. He's old now. Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the what? They said, we want to be just like the Gentiles. And that was a, a, that was a sin. By the way, when it says, thy sons walk not in thy ways, in that Jewish custom, that man who was that, that prophet, his sons were supposed to walk in his stead. But his sons, they were greedy for gain and stuff. So they were evil. So the people says, we don't want them. Make us a king like the nations. Now look at verse 6. But the thing displeased Samuel. See, Samuel was wise. He was a man of God. He says, this is not what God wants you to do, be like the other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. Now watch this. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected who? Me that I should not reign over them. That's the point. When Israel desired, this guy Saul desired from the tribe of Benjamin. What in essence was behind it was a spiritual thing. They said, we're tired of hearing from God through you, the prophet Samuel. We want to be just like all the nations around us. And God looks at, at, he looks at their heart and he goes, they don't want you, Samuel. That's not the issue. You're not the issue, Samuel. They really don't want me. See, when you reject the counsel of God through that person of God, the man of God, the man who communicates that truth, you're really rejecting God. Paul says it over here. He says, don't despise the word of God given to you because when you do that, you're really despising God because his Holy Spirit is in that, in that truth, okay? Look at verse 22. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 22. And the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, go ye every man unto his city. It was done now. Look at chapter 9. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish. It's C-I-S in the uh, New Testament, Kish. The son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekorak, the son of Aphia. A Benjamite, now watch this, a mighty man of what? Ah, see, they said, we want that guy's son. We, we want power. See, the human flesh always desired to be powerful and everything. When the Lord showed up, the reason they rejected him, or well, one of the reasons, the, the, the top reasons, because they didn't know the scriptures. They, they, they didn't see him in scripture. 
But second, he was a lowly Galilean. He wasn't this conquering hero. This guy over here, the Antichrist, going to come as a conquering hero. But but Lord been telling him in the scriptures that I have to come and suffer lowly uh, first. I had to be lowly, meek and lowly on the coat, the fold of an ass. I got to be meek and lowly, die, and then I'm going to come back in power and great glory. They said, we don't want that. We don't want that. Here, they want this guy. They want a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And so that's where Saul came in at, okay? Go back to chat. Hold your hand in 1 Samuel. Go back to uh, Acts chapter 13 because I want you to see something. We're going to go back here in a minute. Go back to Acts 13, but hold your hand in 1 Samuel. Let's look at the next verse. Acts 13, uh, look at the end of verse 21. So uh, they asked for Saul, the son of Sis, that's that guy Kish we just saw, a man of the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin means mighty power, right hand. That's what we want. And how long did God give them, give them Saul? By the space of what? 40 years. Now, the, the number 40 in the Bible is significant. 40 in your Bible, and this is important because you're going to see it a lot. 40 is the number of trial or testing, okay? God was testing the nation of Israel for 40 years through Saul. Now watch this. Israel came out of Egypt. They were in the wilderness for 40 years. Moses was on Mount Sinai 40 years. The Lord was in the wilderness 40 years. From A.D. 30 when the Lord died, A.D. 30, to A.D. 70, when that temple was destroyed by Titus, 40 years. 40 is, is, is synonymous with the nation of Israel especially. It's trial and testing. So God was testing them in their unbelief by this guy Saul, okay? So he says 40 years. Look at the next verse, verse 22, Acts 13, 22. And when he had removed him. Who is the he there? Who removed Saul? God did. Look at this. Watch it, verse 22. And when he, that's God, had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Now, before we look at David, I want to show you what, it, what he was talking about when he removed Saul. The question is, why did God remove Saul? We'll go back to chapter uh, 1 Samuel and look at verse, excuse me, chapter number 15. 1 Samuel 15, in your own study of the Old Testament, when Paul quotes the Old Testament, because people say, well, Ron, how do I study the Bible? How do I learn the Old Testament? Well, first thing, you come and join us for Bible studies every Thursday and Sundays. That's what we do here. But, because I get those calls on the radio, people say, well, do you, do you go in the Old Testament? I say, yeah, at, at church, 20, 20 minutes on the radio, I got to teach you Paul, right? Nobody else says. But when you come to church, we look at the Old Testament. When Paul goes back to the, the Old Testament like that, he's talking about Saul and David. Then go back and read it. That's what we're doing. That's Bible study. This issue back here, let's, let's look at it. He says, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, look at verse 11. Start at verse 10. 1 Samuel 15, verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. Now let me stop right there. Saul started off good. He, he was anointed by God. When God had a, a king, he anointed him. Samuel went, the prophet went and, and anointed the man with oil. He had God's blessing on him. He started off fine, and God would bless the man if he if he believed God's word. Well, Saul got puffed up with pride. He was looking at David because he didn't like David. He was envious of David. David was a very humble shepherd boy. Saul kept trying to kill David. David was gracious to Saul because David didn't try to kill Saul. He had many chances too, but he trusted the Lord to avenge his enemies, avenge his mind. He had a heart like God. We'll see what that means. So, Saul did some, some things to the point where God, he just says, you know what? It's enough for you. Forty years is over for your reign. It's time to go. That's where we're at here. Verse 11, it repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. Again, when I see the word repent, repenteth. Repentant does not mean being sorry for your sins like religion teaches. 
Because if repentance means to be sorry for your sins, as religion teaches, then God has to be sorry for a sin. He's not a sinner, right? No. Genesis 6, verse 6, the first time the word repent is used is in reference to God. Most of the time the word repentance is used in the Bible, it's in reference to God. So you cannot be being sorry for your sin. It means to change your mind or turn around and go in another direction. God went that way with Saul. He says, that's not the way because Saul's unbelief. I'm going to turn and go to David. That's what the repent means, okay? Verse 11, 1 Samuel 15, verse 11. It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. Why? For, for here's the further explanation. He is turned back from following who? Me. God, it was fine with Saul as long as Saul followed God, God's word. The moment Saul turned away from God's word, God says, I'm going to turn away from you. Verse 11, and hath not performed my commandments. In that day, you had to perform God's commandments to be righteous. There's some, I, I can't believe there are brethren in the grace message who believe everybody was saved by God's grace through faith plus no works. Some people believe that. When, you read, when I read that, God said, because the guy didn't perform my commandments, I'm rejecting him. It's clear to me. Hopefully it is to you. He says, he hath not performed my commandments, verse 11, and it grieved Samuel and he cried unto the Lord all night. I love Samuel. This old evil king at this time, and Samuel just praying for him. You, I'm going to tell you why it grieved Samuel, because Samuel understood the issue of authority. Even though Saul was evil, Samuel continually prayed for Saul. But Samuel also knew that as the nation's head goes, so does the nation. I was talking to some of the saints, and it's, I'm not political. I just, I'm a, I'm a Bible-believing Christian. As your leader goes in his values, so does the nation goes. What Samuel was crying about is he says, you know what? Saul has brought God's disdain on our nation. Look at verse 12, 1 Samuel 15, verse 12. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to uh, Carmel, and behold, he set him up a, pl a place and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. So Samuel's going to get Saul to let him know God has rejected him. Verse 13, and Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Oh, no, he didn't. He says to him, he says, Blessed be thou, brother of the Lord, you know, religious. I have performed all that the Lord told me to perform. And in the context, there were some things that he had to do. But look at verse 14. And Samuel said, what meaneth then this bleating of the sheep in mine ears and the lowering of the oxen, which I hear? What's going on there? God told Saul to go and destroy some, some Gentile. He says, destroy the people and the animals. Don't take the best of the animals and, and, and be religious and going to sacrifice. Just do what I said, destroy it all. Well, Saul, instead of obeying God, he kept the, 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 the animals for religious purposes, you know, he's going to be religious. And so what Samuel, he says, if you did what God commanded you, how come I hear those sheep going bah, bah, over there? And the whoo of the ox, you know, that's what he's talking about. If you did what God said and destroyed all the animals, how come I hear the animals over there? What you do? That's what he's saying, verse 15. And Saul said, I love this, I love it. They, they did it. They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. You know what he did? The king, who got all power, goes, I couldn't help it, man. They wanted it that way. See how he passed the blame like Adam and Eve? Human nature just says, pass the blame. Saul is the king. He can do what he wants. If he told the people to destroy them all, they would do it. He did that. The guy at the top is the, is the one who's in charge. So he blamed the people. Now, from this, God gets rid of Saul. Go down to verse 26 for time's sake. First, first Samuel 15, 26. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee. Saul says, please pray to God for my, on my behalf. Verse 26. For thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. There it is. 
when it says that God removed Saul, that's the passage because Saul would not obey God. Now, here's the beautiful part about it. Look at verse 28. I love this. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. I love that. He says, he's taking it from you, and he's going to give it to a man better than you. And what made David better than Saul is not because David of himself, but David had a hard attitude to believe God. Let's look at it. Go back to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 13, and look at verse 22. Acts chapter 13 and verse 22, Luke writes, And when he, that's God, had removed him, that's Saul, he raised up unto them, Israel, who? David. You know what the name David means? Anybody know what the name David means? It's a popular name, even in our day. The name is, is, in the Hebrew is David. It means beloved. I like that. When God looked at this young boy, who was the eighth son of Jesse, he was the youngest one. Nobody even paid attention. His own brothers didn't pay attention. He's just out there amongst the, amongst the sheep, fighting off in the name of the Lord, fighting off bears and fighting off lions and stuff. A, a young shepherd boy who believed God's word, that's David. Watch what made him smooth in the eyes of God. Not smooth is from the hood, sorry. Watch what made him acceptable. When he had removed him, verse 22, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he, this is God, gave testimony and said, I have found beloved David, the son of Jesse. The name Jesse, by the way, we're going to see that in Romans 15 as well. The name Jesse means, it has a couple of meanings. Now watch this. It means wealth and possessor, a wealthy possessor, a possession of wealth. But watch this. It has a double meaning, and it's important. Jesse means one who possesses wealth, but it also means the one who is the gift or sacrifice. Now, that's important. There's going to be someone who has all wealth, possession of wealth, but he's also going to be a gift and a sacrifice. Just remember that. He's wealthy, but he's going to eventually be a sacrifice at the same time. Kind of sound familiar to somebody. For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich in heaven's glory, yet for our sakes he became poor, came down here, that we through his poverty might be made rich. Jesse, that name Jesse is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And from him, from him is raised up David, the beloved. Look here. He says, I have found David, the son of Jesse. Now, here's my prayer for me and all of you all right here. A man after mine own what? Did you know God had a heart? God has a soul. God gets grieved in his soul. But when, wouldn't you want God to look at you, a human, and go, that's a person who has a heart after me. When it says he, he's after God's own heart, the thing that God's heart desires, David did. The things that God rejoiced in, David did. And the things that God hated, David hated. When God looked at him, he says, we, we see things eye to eye. Me, I talked to my, about my wife like that. She's after my own heart. We're after each other's heart. It's just, we just go together, compatible. When God looked at David, he says, there's a man who gets me right there. He gets me. David looks at God and says, what, whatever you want. That's, I, you hate that? I hate it. You love that? I love it. That's David. That's, that's what your prayer ought to be for yourself. Watch this. Here's the definition of a man after mine own heart. Look at verse 22. Which shall, what's that next word? Fulfill how much of God's will? All my will. If you want to be someone who is a man or woman after God's own heart, God expects you to do this, to fulfill. That means finish it. That word fulfill means to do and finish all his will. Now today, the will of God is found in Paul's grace message. How do you know if you're a, wo a woman or a man who, who is after God's own heart like David? As you continue on in the grace of God given to the Apostle Paul, 
and do those good works of grace that God has put in the, the Apostle Paul's Romans through Philemon. You fulfill his will. When you wake up tomorrow and says, Lord, I want to be that woman or man after your own heart, and thank you that you've given me the Apostle Paul and then some instruction, and you've given us Twin Cities Grace Fellowship where we preach and teach. Those things, that's how you get there. Look what it says. He says, a man after mine own heart. Now, some of you all are familiar with David. Others aren't. So for, for that sake, and plus people on the, um, the video and on the Internet may not be familiar with David, let's go back to 1 Samuel chapter number 16. Go to, go to 1, 1 Samuel 16. This might be a refresher, but it's, it's an enjoyable refresher for some. And look at verse 1, if you will. 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, this is the prophet again, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Samuel's heart was, was hurt because of Saul's disobedience and then God's rejection. And he would, he would pray before the Lord in sackcloth and ashes and just mourn, mourn, mourn. And God says, stop mourning. Get up, anoint yourself, and go down to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. That's what we're going to tell him. He says, verse 16, verse 1, fill thine horn with oil. He says, get up and get the oil, the anointing oil, and take, put it in your horn. Oh, it, was a, it was like a, a ram's horn. It was just a, a, a hollow thing where they poured the oil and carried it. Okay. Fill thy horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me. A king among his sons. Did you see how God says, I have provided me a king amongst his sons? Now, Jesse has eight sons. And in the context, I won't do it for time's sake, Samuel gets there and he says, Jesse, call all your sons in. Seven of them are right there in the vicinity, and David's out there amongst the, the, the sheep. So he calls them. They all big, you know, strong men coming on in here. Samuel looks at one of them. God says, that's not him. Now, the, the guy looks like he should be king, you know. He says, not him. Bring them all, not him. And he goes through all seven of them. And he says, do you have any more sons? He says, well, yeah, but yeah, you wouldn't be interested in little David over there. He's just out with the sheep. God says, that's the one I want. Watch this. Go down to verse 13. We'll start at verse 11. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? Because he went through seven of the boys. And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down, that was to eat, till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy. Uh, that, that word ruddy in your King James Bible, it, it means red. It's, it's used in Genesis 25, 25 with Esau. Esau, his hair was red. It means red, rare hair. Red, how do you say, red-headed? Is that, is that? Uh, David had red hair and red hair on his arms like Esau, okay, ruddy. And with all of a beautiful countenance, he had the joy of the Lord. His countenance was, he had a, a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. He was a handsome young, young man. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. Do you see what's going on here? You probably don't see this, but that's a type of the coronation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the scene. There's the prophet of God. The father of all the boys is there, like God the father. The youngest one, the one whom God has chosen to reign is there. And all his brethren are around him. That's the kingdom. In the coronation of the Lord Jesus Christ, all the people of Israel will be there. And it's going to be the Father who makes the pro proclamation. That whole thing where God is up there when he's anointed with the Spirit in his baptism, he says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That's what's going to happen at the coronation of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what, that's what this is a picture of. Look what it says. Verse 13, uh, 1 Samuel 16, 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. Now watch this. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David.
from that day forward, so Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So Samuel goes back to where he's from. Now watch this. When the Spirit of the Lord came upon David, it didn't come in him like we get today. I want you to rightly divide the scriptures. When you and I are chosen by God, as it were, through the gospel of grace, you trust Christ, the Spirit of God doesn't just, it doesn't come upon you. He, he comes in you. Eternal life as a present possession. When it says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward, that's why David in Psalm 51 says, take not thy Holy Spirit away from me when he committed murder, uh, excuse me, yeah, murder after he committed adultery with Bathsheba and murdered her, her husband Uriah the Hittite. See, when God anointed a king, he put his spirit on him. And as long as that man was worthy of the spirit of God, see, that's the difference between law and grace. As long as you're worthy, you're okay. When David committed adultery and murder, two things under the Ten Commandments that you couldn't offer a sacrifice, you had to go to hell. David prayed, he says, don't take your Holy Spirit. God had mercy on David. Let's see that. Oh, man. Now look at that. Look at the next verse. Look what happened to Saul. Verse 14. 1 Samuel 16, 14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from who? Oh, he took his spirit away. But he didn't just take the spirit away. The Holy Spirit. When God took a Holy Spirit away from you, he didn't just leave you. He gave you something else. The Lord Jesus Christ says when the spirit, when an evil spirit is cast out of man, the reason Christ was casting out devils, he was cleaning up Israel. But he goes, if you don't get the, the Holy Spirit, the spirit, not only does he come back to the guy, he brings some other spirit. There were more spirits in Israel than people in Israel. So these, these spirits, they, they want a physical body to, you know, to be in. He, look what he did here. Verse 14, and an evil spirit from who? The Lord troubled him. How about that? <laughs> I talked to Calvinists about that one right there. Yeah, that gets him. God says, I create evil. God says, I send an evil spirit on you. And people who don't rightly divide the word don't understand those passages. Calvinists believe that God is the one that causes all the bad things, the evil things happen. And they'll say, see, he gave him an evil spirit. He causes evil. Well, see, that's under the what? Law. You got to rightly divide. Israel covenant with God under this temporal covenant called the law of Moses, that when they were good, he would bless them. And, and do them good. When they were evil, he would curse them and do them evil. What do you think those council meetings up there are for? When God is up there in the book of Job, and he calls the angels who are operating the heavenly places, but see, there are some evil angels that are still in these positions. God is so into order and authority, he won't kick them out until he's ready with the body of Christ. So until then, these guys still come and, and have council meetings. First Kings chapter 22, when, when, when Ahab was out there and he had the prophets of Baal, the evil prophets, God asked us, uh, who, who's, who are we going to send? And one of the evil spirits says, Lord, I'll go down there and get him. He says, yeah, be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Even with Job, a type of the nation of Israel, Satan says, God, let me do some things with him. And they're having this council meeting. God says, go ahead, but don't you take his life. God let Satan do some things to, it's a type with the Israel. Can I tell you something? God had a council meeting. He sent one of his, look at here, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. He told that spirit, you know, Saul's my anointed king and he's not listening to me. God took his spirit from Saul and sent an evil spirit to him. Get two passages. I'm going to show you how that works in the dispensation of grace. Get 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Timothy chapter number 1. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter, what did I tell you, 5? Go to 5, check 5. This wasn't in my notes, but as I look at this, I want you to see how that works today. In 1 Corinthians 5, 
there's a man in the, in the Corinthian assembly who did a sin of fornication that Gentiles, lost heathens, didn't do, which is to have his own father's wife. Even lost people in our land know that that's something, there's something wrong with that. If you say to the average lost person, is it right or wrong for a man to take his father's wife? They'd be like, oh, no, that's, that's unclean. Lost people know that. That's what this guy was doing and was puffed up about it. I believe he was in leadership teaching, hey, we're saved by God's grace for eternal. We can do what we want. One extreme. So, so Paul says, oh, is that so? Verse 4, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 4. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, that's the saints, and my spirit, when he's talking about my spirit, he's talking about through the power of this word of God right here, and with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto who? Satan. Why? For the destruction of the flesh. Now, the difference between Saul, he was done. By God's marvelous grace and mercy, you're saved. You'll never lose your eternal life. But you got, This is what he did. That the spirit may be saved in the day of Jesus Christ. And, and what he's talking about, at the judgment seat of Christ, God's, God wants that man to recover himself through the chastening, and get right so that he can get a full reward. And when you put someone out of the local assembly of the body of Christ, particularly grace ministry, Satan and his dominions run to get them. Why? You're a member of the body of Christ. There is safety in numbers. The reason why you need to be here each week is because there's power and strength when we're together. The reason why I start off with prayer and song it's those satanic evil forces don't like us praising God. And if you're a stranded grace believer out here, like cutting off my arm, my hand, that's going to wither away. There's something to letting someone out of the assembly where Satan gets them. Go over to say, this is not just in his early epistles, in 2 Timothy. Go to 2 Timothy. Oh, man. My wife ain't going to be telling me I forgot. Hold on a second. Wait a minute. That they may learn not to blaspheme. That's the one. Might be First Timothy, so hold on a second. Hold on a second. My wife's going to get me, y'all. Y'all know that because I forgot the past. This wasn't on Ah. It was the one where he says, I delivered Hymenaeus and another guy so that they may learn not to blaspheme. I'm sorry, I hadn't meant to, wanted to go there, but um, man. well, I apologize. Maybe it's First Timothy. First Timothy one yes, thank you, Dean and my wife. First Timothy what? One twenty. Yeah, go over there. Here's a latter epistle of Paul, because somebody could say, "Oh, First Corinthians that was early in Paul's ministry." Well, this is late. This is his second to last epistle. 1 Timothy 1, look at verse 20. No, start at verse 19. Holding faith, that's the doctrine. And a good conscience, that's letting the doctrine work in you. Which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. There were some who had Pauline truth and they put it away from them. Now watch this. Of these some, in Timothy's day, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom... I have delivered unto who? Satan. Why? That they may learn not to blaspheme. I'm just saying, there's power in numbers of the body of Christ. And when a saint decides that they're going to live that lifestyle of sin that starts to affect the, 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 the congregation, the assembly, Paul's instructions is to just let them go like God did with the Gentiles. Let them be out there, and the, the, the Satan's attack, it should drive them to their knees and run back to the assembly. Last passage as we come down to the end. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. What happened to that guy who they kicked out the assembly? Well, Satan got him. And this guy was wise enough to see what was going on and got back in with, right with God. Second Corinthians chapter number two, 
Verse 4, Paul is recounting this issue of having to put the run brother out. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. But if any have caused grief, and that's what the guy caused, the offense caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, Paul wasn't mad at the guy, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this, what? Punishment is good. Mm -hmm. Which was inflicted of many. The whole congregation decided, not decided, they, they obeyed God and Paul and put them out. So that contrary wise, ye ought rather to, what? Forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such an one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. The guy got beat down by Satan, says, it's better for me to be right with God with my brothers and sisters in that local assembly than to be out here getting destroyed by the adversary who's just looking to destroy him. Now look what he says. Verse 8, wherefore I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. Look at verse 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Paul says that Satan is looking for any opportunity to destroy a grace believer. I'm laughing because Satan was like, yeah, give them to me. Just let him live out on his own without the rest of the body. I got them. Now, that guy was wise enough to recover himself, but the, the Corinthians were always on the extreme. When he came back in repentance, they said, get out of here. We don't want you. Paul says, get rid of you. And Paul says, no, 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 bring him back. He repented. He repented. And that's, that's life. And, and, and that's the dispensation of grace. It happens in, in all of God's word. And what I want you to see is that, let's end in, in Acts 13. This is an important issue to see about David. Because it's, it's through David that God will give the ultimate king to the nation of Israel, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's end here. Acts chapter 13. Speaking of David, uh, the son of Jesse at the end, verse 22. A man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's, what? Seed, David will give, will be in the seed line of the Messiah, or the Messiah will be in the seed line of David. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised up unto all men a Savior, Jesus. Is that what it said? Uh-uh. That's how religion reads that passage. I bet someone would just read it just like that, raise unto all men a say. No, no, raise up unto who? Israel a savior, Jesus. Now in the next session, when we look at the book of Romans, Paul is in a, a similar passage in Romans 15. I want you to remember though, in verse 23, the Lord God of heaven promised the nation of Israel his son. Unto us, Isaiah says, a child is born and a son is given. God did not owe the Gentiles this man right here, the Lord Jesus Christ. What Paul is going to explain in Romans 15 is that God is so merciful and so caring of people, even though he promised Israel this Savior, he's going to let the crumbs fall from their table to the Gentiles, just like that parable where that woman says the crumbs fall to the dogs. See, God is so gracious that even though he promised them, he's going to bless the Gentiles. But here's the mystery. Not only in prophecy was he that gracious, he already before time had a program to save us heathen Gentiles, had nothing to do with Israel. That's the mystery of Christ, that through the fall of Israel, salvation come to the Gentiles. Okay, so we're going to finish next week. Please read this week, Acts chapter 13, verses 24 to the end. We're going to be in verse 24. We're going to probably get about five or six verses uh, next week. Look at verse 24. When John, when John had first preached before the coming, uh, for his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of who? Amen. We're going to look at those two. We're going to look at John the Baptist's ministry and the issue of the Messiah being David's seed. That's important, okay? All right, let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your truth. Oh, Father, we love the book of Acts because it, it's just laying out your program uh, with the nation of Israel, but also... As the Apostle Paul is laying out these things, he will finally get to what you're doing today through him and through us as members of the body of Christ. Father, it was wonderful to see that at the conference in Green Bay that two times you, you used the word special in your word. 
once back there in Deuteronomy with the nation of Israel. And that second and last time was you did special miracles through the hands of Paul. And it was through the Apostle Paul, Father, that we learn about your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, not according to the prophetic program, but the mystery program that you, he died for the sins, not just of Israel, but of the Gentiles also. We thank you for this message of the heavenly places for us, Father, and we thank you for the message of the earthly places for your believing remnant nation of Israel. As we take our break, we give you all the praise.